Thank you, Leslie, for that beautiful song. Let's bow our head in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, um, as I believe the words of that song goes, may your name be glorified. Glorify your name, Lord. Speak through me today. Tell us what we need to hear. Help us to experience your presence in a very special way today. In Jesus' name, amen. When you tell people that you are from Seattle, uh, people who maybe don't live in Seattle, friends, family, when you say, I live in Seattle, I'm from Seattle, you generally get one of two responses. It's either something about Sleepless in Seattle, <laughs> that old 90s Tom Hanks movie, or rain, right? Those are the two things. That's the, that's the stereotype of Seattle, isn't it? That's pretty much what people know. When you live here, you experience so much more than that. You see the beauty of the Puget Sound, Lake Washington. You see the Cascade Mountains, the Olympic Mountains, Mount Rainier. You see all this beauty around you. And, and of course, the people and uh, your favorite spots, your favorite locations, your favorite things to do. When you live in a place, a place becomes very meaningful to you. But when you don't, you tend to just see a stereotype. There tends to be just kind of one thing that you think about. Uh, for example, when I think of Tanzania, I think of uh, African safari, I think of elephants and lions, these kinds of things. But I imagine if you ask Violet what she thinks of Tanzania, she has a much bigger picture of it because she's from there. Previously, when I thought of Peru, I thought of just Machu Picchu. But of course, there's people who actually live in Peru as well. And, and now I think about those, those people who live on the hill and how we've been helping them. Well, people think of Texas, they think of cowboys and horses and deserts. Uh, we didn't see many cowboys when we lived in Texas, actually. <laughs> Maybe that's because we were in Dallas, Texas, I don't know. But the, the stereotype of a place tends to be a little bit different. In Jesus' day, not many people had seen Rome for themselves. They hadn't experienced the, the great forum. They hadn't seen the palaces. They hadn't seen the grand marketplaces. They hadn't met the people, talked to them, gotten to know them. Most people in Jesus' day, living under the Roman Empire, their stereotype when they thought of Rome was the cross. Because they, they probably would never see the Rome, the place, in their lives. But everybody living under Roman occupation had seen a crucifixion. Romans, they did crucifixion for that very reason, not because only it was painful, not because only it was a torturous way to die, but also because they could do it so publicly that they would do the crucifixions, they would crucify people along the major streets all throughout the Roman Empire. And they would hang either above their heads or around their necks the offense that the person had committed. The obvious message was, if you do this, the same thing will happen to you. And so it was an act of punishment, capital punishment, but also in many ways an act of terror because they were showing the people of their empire, this is what happens when you cross us. And the irony there is that now we think of the cross as this great spiritual thing, right? We have crosses, we see them in churches and decorations and things like that. People wear the cross around their neck. But when we go back to the time of Jesus, the cross was a symbol of Roman terror. It was a way that the Romans controlled the population in the far-flung regions of their empire. And so when we read about the cross, I think it's useful to remember what the people who were experiencing the crucifixion, who were seeing it, what they thought was happening. When they see Jesus on the cross, they're not thinking, oh, isn't this great that the Savior of the world is dying for our sins? No. They thought, well, they got another one. Here's another victim of the Roman Empire. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 15. I alluded to this previously, but we've been reading through the New Testament as a church. We just finished the book of Mark. Started the Gospel of Luke. But we're turning now to Mark 15. 
Mark chapter 15, of course, this is another version of the crucifixion. This is Mark's version of the crucifixion, Mark chapter 15. In verse 15, uh, sorry, 25, Mark 15, 25, it says it was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. Again, this is, it was not uncommon for there to be a sign telling everybody who passed by what this person was convicted of. And we know from other gospels that the Pharisees complained and they said, well, it should say he claimed to be the king of the Jews. But they put up king of the Jews as, a, as an interesting level of irony because it's true. This charge was true. Jesus really was the king of the Jews and is, in fact, the king of the entire world. And so it goes on. It says, verse 27, they crucified two robbers with him, one on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. And it goes on, verse 31, in the same way the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. And those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Now this was a regular part of the crucifixion process. There was a, a public humiliation was a, a part of what it meant to be crucified. It wasn't just that it was painful for the person who was undergoing this terrible thing. It was also that there was a social aspect of people laughing at them, mocking them, accusing them as they passed by. This was typical. And Ellen White makes an interesting point about this mocking, about what they're saying to Jesus. In The Desire of Ages, she says that when the people passing by mock him and say, well, he saved others, let him save himself. Why doesn't he come down from the cross? Ellen White in The Desire of Ages says that that mockery that they are casting upon Jesus while he was on the cross is actually, in its essence, the same temptation that Satan used to tempt him in the desert. Because what happens when Jesus was in the wilderness, you know, at first Satan tries to tempt him to, to turn the stones into bread. But after that, what does Satan tempt him with? He says, he takes him up to the highest point of the temple, and he says, throw yourself down and let the angels catch you. Well, what's the temptation there? The temptation is the temple. The temple in Jerusalem was the most populous, was the busiest place in Jerusalem, in all of Israel. And so if Jesus had hurled himself from the top, and if all of these people, this crowd of people, had seen him falling and then be caught by angels, Jesus would be showing them his power, and then everybody would want to instantly make him king, would want to, to follow him and to serve him and to worship him. He would be using his own power to make everybody follow him. And it gets even bigger because the next temptation that Satan gives him in the, in the wilderness was he, he takes him to a high mountain and he says, I will give you all of it. I'll give you the entire world if you will bow down to me. And so early on, the first part of Jesus' ministry, Satan tempts Jesus to take the easy way out. He says, look, you know, Jesus knew, even at, at the very beginning, Jesus knew that he would have to die on the cross. He knew that he would have to go through this. And so Satan, as he is tempting Jesus in the wilderness, he is saying, look, Jesus, just do this instead. It'll be a lot easier. We can make it everybody's going to follow you. They'll believe in you. They'll see your power. If you just do this, you won't have to have people doubt you. You won't have to have people argue against you. You won't have to die on a cross if you would just take the easy way out. And Ellen White says that that temptation is the same temptation that Jesus is presented with while he is hanging on the cross, because could Jesus have come down from a power perspective? Yeah, he could have. Jesus makes this comment when he's being arrested in the Garden of Eden. He says, I could call thousands of angels and they would come save me. So he could do it. And imagine if Jesus says the word, and angels come and take him down from the cross, if he bursts out from the cross, what better sign would there be 
that Jesus was more powerful than Rome. Because the cross was the symbol of Rome. And so for Jesus to come down off of the cross in the viewing of all of these people, showing them that I am more powerful than this cross ever could be, yeah, if Jesus had done that, instant kingship. Everybody would have followed him immediately. And so Ellen White makes this point that in the wilderness and also on the cross, Jesus is facing the same temptation. Is he going to use his power to coerce people to follow him? And so this gets at the very heart of what keeps Jesus on the cross. Because he could have come down. He could have. When, when they're mocking him, he could have showed them right away, yeah, okay, you're right, I am more powerful, I'm just going to come down. He could have done it. So what keeps Jesus on the cross? If, they, if he had come down, they would have all followed him. We know that even as Jesus was being arrested, his disciples were willing to fight with him. They were willing to stay with him. Peter draws a sword and starts cutting people's ears off. The disciples don't run away until they realize that Jesus isn't interested in fighting. When Jesus gives himself up to be arrested, that's when the disciples all run away. And so if Jesus had used his power, had shown them that, yeah, we're going to stand up to the Romans, people would have followed him. So what kept Jesus on the cross? Well, it was his love for us, wasn't it? It was the fact that he knew that if he came down from the cross, we would be lost. But why is that? Why was it so important for Jesus to die on a cross for us? I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis, or the very beginning, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, this famous story, Eve eating the fruit from the tree, the fall of humanity, the beginning of sin. And Genesis chapter 3 starts telling us about this serpent who asks the woman, did God, this is verse 1, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And there's a continued dialogue that goes back and forth, verses 2 and 3. She tells, Eve tells um, the serpent what God said to her, or even though she doesn't report it quite right. And then verse 4, the serpent says, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You know, most of us know this story, right? She even counters the serpent. The serpent tempts her, and Eve eats the fruit, and then Eve gives the fruit to Adam, and they both eat the fruit, this fruit that they were not supposed to eat. And we talk about this as the beginning of sin, which it is. This is the beginning of, of disobedience. But really, it was not the disobedience that led to sin. It was not the disobedience that caused Adam and Eve to fall and brought all of this, all of the, the hurt, the heartache that we see in this world today. It's not the disobedience that started it. It was Eve's distrust. Because if she truly believed God, if she truly took God at his word, she wouldn't have given it a second thought. If she truly trusted that God had her best interest at heart, she would say, look, God said not to eat it, so I won't, just like that. It was her mistrust of God, her doubt about what God had told her, that then leads to disobedience. And so before there is disobedience, there is always first distrust. If I, you know, if I truly believe that God's way is the best way, I'm not going to do these bad things, right? But if I, if I distrust God and I think, you know what, I actually know better than God here. I'm going to do this because it seems more fun or it seems, more, it seems like it'll be better for me in the long run or whatever it is, when we choose to disobey God, we are showing that we don't trust what God has told us, that we think that we know better or that society knows better or that Satan knows better. We're listening to someone else rather than God. And just think about this for a minute. The God of the entire universe creates the earth, creates the Garden of Eden. Eve is literally created, the Bible says, out from the rib of her husband. And so this God creates Eve. And yet, as Eve's walking along, she takes the word of a random talking snake in a tree. <laughs> and yet, don't we do the same thing? Don't we listen to all the wrong people when we want to hear their advice rather than what the good advice truly is? 
When we were young, didn't we listen to our friends more than our parents? Just the way that we are. We like to hear what we want to hear. Eve saw the fruit, thought it was good, and so she chose to believe a talking serpent rather than the God who had created her. And at its heart, this temptation asks, is God on our side? Is God really doing what's best for us? Is God truly loving? And when we doubt that, when we ask ourselves that question, when we're not sure if it's true, then we're going to be led to do all kinds of misdeeds, all kinds of disobedience. That's the great controversy theme. We talk about the great controversy a lot in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's not a controversy about power, about who's more powerful. The controversy is about who is better, who is more loving, who is honest, who is true. Satan, when he tempts Eve, he's telling him, you can't trust in God. That is the heart of the great controversy. Can God be trusted? Is God's way truly the best way? And it's so important to understand this because God is the source of our life. We get everything that we have from God. In Genesis 2 verse 7, when it talks about Adam being created, it says that God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground and breathed into him the breath of life. So without that breath from God, without that influence from God, there's no life. The life comes from that connection with our Creator. A turn to, if you will, Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46, and I'll read verses 3 and 4. Isaiah 46, 3 and 4. Continuing on this theme of that everything that we have, our very life comes from God, our Creator. Uh, Isaiah 46, 3 and 4. It says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, all you who remain in the house of Israel, you whom I have upheld since you were conceived and have carried since your birth, even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he, and I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. And so this is saying from your birth, until you have gray hairs on your head until the very end. It is God who sustains us, who gives us life. Our very existence comes from our God. That's why Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. Because when we choose to distrust God, when we choose to disobey God, we are separating ourselves from the source of our life. And what happens when you separate yourself from life? Death. That's just part of the natural consequence. I think of it kind of like a robot. Um, you've heard in the news lately, there's been a lot of talk about artificial intelligence, AI. You can go and find AI that will make a picture for you if you just tell it what to draw. Uh, you can go and have a conversation with different types of AI out there. I've even heard teachers complaining that they've gotten students now who are turning in assignments that have been written by artificial intelligence. Yeah, so it's an interesting world we live in. So imagine, maybe just a few years down the road, that someone puts this artificial intelligence, this AI, into an actual moving robot. Imagine an engineer designs the legs, makes the feet to be able to hold the balance well, you know, makes the torso that can send all these signals to the various extremities, makes arms, makes fingers, makes hands, makes a head where the AI actually is housed. So imagine it makes this robot, downloads this AI into the robot, but imagine this engineer, you know, he's, he's seen the science fiction movies, he knows, so he wants to put a fail safe in. And so he makes sure that the robot has to be plugged in. And if, if the robot unplugs himself, then he'll be turned off. And so imagine this all takes place and he makes this robot, artificial intelligence, all this, all this has been done, all this work. And then he, he plugs it in for the very first time. And he introduces himself, you know, hello, new robot, I'm your engineer, I made you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see what you come up with and you know, what your programming helps you to learn and, and develop. Um, but one thing you should know is that you're, you're plugged in. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's where you get your power, that's what's making you, you know, have, be able to work. I've given you a nice long cord so you can go all around wherever you want, but just make sure that you don't trip over it, make sure that you don't unplug yourself accidentally. So imagine all this takes place. And the very first thing, you know, he's, 
the engineer pauses and he waits to see what this brand new AI will do. Imagine if the AI just turns around and unplugs himself, <laughs> the very first thing that he does. That's what we did as a human race, right? Because God told us, here I have made you, I have created you, I have made you perfect. Just trust me. Just believe me when I tell you what is good for you. And Adam and Eve didn't. They mistrusted God. And the truth is that many, many times in our life, we don't either. We don't believe truly in our heart of hearts that God has what's best for us. We think that we can do it ourselves. I think it was a preacher by the name of A.W. Tozer who once said that your image of God, what, what you think about when you think of God, is the most important thing about you. What you think of God. Is God a vindictive God? Is God just out to get you? So you just have to be perfect all the time? Is God someone who doesn't approve of you? Or is God someone who genuinely, wholeheartedly, unconditionally loves you? Your image of God is one of the most important things about you. And so from the very beginning, the lie has been, God doesn't love you. You can't trust him. And by acting out of that mistrust, we have brought ourselves into a place where we die, where we sin, where we do all of these bad things. And so we go back then to the cross. And if you want to turn back to Mark 15, I'll be referencing a few of these verses again. We go back to the cross. Because these mockers, these people who are ridiculing Jesus, who are speaking out, shouting out at him, are under the impression that if he were a true savior, he would be able, to, he would just come down. Right, verse, verse 30, come down from the cross and save yourself, the onlookers said. Uh, verse 31, the chief priests and teachers, they mocked him and they say, he saved others, but he can't save himself. The assumption there, the understanding there, is that if he were truly a savior, he would save himself first. And that is true if the question were a question of power, whether the Son of God is truly powerful. And, and let's be clear, Jesus had shown some power. He had healed people. He had cast out demons. He had fed the 5,000. He had calmed the storm. But all of those things were not what proved Jesus to be the Son of God. All of those things were not what we as a human race needed to see. Because power, yes, it can coerce, it can force you to do something, but it doesn't change the heart. In order for Jesus to be our Savior, he had to stay on that cross to show us that he is not just a God of power, but a God of love. A God who chose to be on that cross for us. A God who could have come down from that cross with just a thought, with just a word, and yet decided to be there on that cross for you and for me. A God who experienced the separation from the Father that he had never known. From eternity, he and the Father had been one. He experienced that for us to show us his love, to show us that he would do anything for us. The Bible says, uh, we're skipping down now to verse uh, 37. So Mark 15, verse 37. The Bible says, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last Verse 38, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the, when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. When the centurion, this man who didn't, probably didn't know much about the Jewish God, didn't know much about the Bible, he was a Gentile. When he sees Jesus die, he says, surely this man was the Son of God. Now, to understand a little bit about the ramifications of what he means, for the Romans, there was one Son of God, and that was Caesar. Caesar was called the Son of God. That was one of his titles that Caesar had. And the Son of God was wealthy, the wealthiest man in the entire empire. The Son of God was powerful. The Son of God led armies that would slaughter anyone who got in his way. The Son of God ruled the known world with an iron fist. And yet when this centurion, this Gentile, sees Jesus dying on the cross, he, there's something in his mind that clicks. 
And he recognizes that son of God who lives in the palace in Rome, that's actually not, that's not right. That's not the son of God. This man, this man who died on the cross just now, he must be the son of God. Not because he's powerful, not because of the miracles that he can do, but because of the love that he showed by staying on that cross for you and for me. That is the God that we serve. The great controversy is not fought with power. It is fought in our hearts. Which version of events are we going to believe? Are we going to believe that God is some selfish, capricious God who just wants to control us all the time? Or are we going to believe that our God loves us so much that he would give up everything for us? The great controversy solved once and for all at the cross. And if that weren't enough, God rewards us by, by telling us about the resurrection, to know that even death could not keep that love down, that even death could not keep that love in the grave, that that love had to come back to life because that love is what saves us all. A promise that when we are within God's love, nothing can touch us. Yeah, sure, we can go through some bad times on this earth, yeah, sometimes we get sick. Yeah, sometimes accidents happen. But ultimately, at the end of the day, when Jesus comes again, our future is assured because nothing can separate us from that love, that love that kept Jesus on the cross. I told a children's story about goats and trying to keep the goats from eating the poisonous plants. You know, the truth is, we've eaten the poisonous plants. <laughs> It's not just that Jesus is trying to keep us away from the poisonous plants. We've eaten it. We've done the thing. We've, we've sinned. We've mistrusted God over and over and over again. And yet, by the cross, Jesus saves us. He gives us that second chance. And so we're going to sing a closing hymn today at the cross. And there's lots of good lines in there, but I wanted to read you one just to think about it before we sing it. There's a verse uh, in number 163 that says, Was it for crimes that I have done? He suffered on the tree? The implied answer is yes. And then it says, amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. There's nothing that we could ever experience that matches the love of our Savior hanging on that cross for you and for me. So let us celebrate that love together as we stand and as we sing number 163 